we learned more about each other. Samantha was 24 years old. She got pregnant with Katie in her first year at Kennesaw State University. She married Katie's dad before Katie was born. Her ex-husband was never happy. He blamed Samantha for getting pregnant on purpose to make him marry her, thinking she'd get to be a stay-at-home mom. Their marriage didn't last two years. Her ex didn't want to stay with just one partner, so he left and moved to California. They didn't hear from him for almost three years. Samantha and Katie moved in with her parents in New Harley so she could finish her degree. Samantha is now a nurse at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta in Kennesaw. She still lives in a basement apartment at her parents' house with Katie. We watched Katie throw rocks and sticks into the river while she sang songs. Have you eaten yet? I asked. No, I need to feed Katie, Samantha replied. How about we make some burgers or hot dogs? It's still early, and you can put her to bed after dinner. Katie, would you like a hot dog? Samantha asked. Katie jumped with joy. Yes, yes, yes. If everyone wants hot dogs, we can cook them over the fire and even roast marshmallows after dinner, I said. Samantha agreed. I used some wood in the stone ring to start a new fire, and soon we had hot coals ready for cooking. Samantha, Katie and I prepared sausages, buns, condiments, chips, and tea. We took everything to the picnic table. I showed Katie how to cook the sausage over the coals. Katie soon got tired and sleepy. You'll have to save the marshmallows for next time, I told Samantha. Katie fell asleep in her car seat before they even left. I said goodbye to Samantha through the car window, locked the gate after she drove away, and headed back to clean up. I made sure the fire was out, then took a shower and went to bed. The next morning, I felt like something was missing. I didn't realize how important good communication was. I had been married for over 20 years, but now I see that in the past few months, maybe years, my marriage felt like living with a roommate rather than a partner. Waking up alone made me see that my marriage was over and I was single again. My wife and I grew distant and I didn't try to connect with her. It wasn't all her fault. I stopped paying attention to her long ago. My marriage became comfortable but dull, like an old leather jacket that needs care but was ignored. I failed to keep our relationship strong and it fell apart. This doesn't excuse her betrayal though. I never thought of cheating. I knew it wasn't inevitable for her either. I messaged Ted to let me know when the divorce papers were ready and then went to work. At the office, I did my usual tasks. I checked the duty board for any special activities, logged into the computer to read the latest patrol reports, and looked at names or addresses related to my cases. I reviewed the backgrounds of people mentioned in new cases and started logging activities for them. Before leaving, I scheduled a meeting with a caseworker for a child abuse case. Around 9.30, my phone rang as I parked. Ted Shark's name appeared on the screen. Hey buddy, how did it go? I asked. Yes, the papers are filed. Your divorce has officially started. I thought you might want to handle giving them to Sarah yourself, so I haven't sent them to the sheriff's department yet. After our talk yesterday, I think she accepted the situation and won't fight it. She said she would sign everything without any trouble. Let me call her to arrange a meeting or have your lawyer review the papers first, I suggested. Sounds good to me, Ted replied. After meeting Mickey Ramsey, a cheerful blonde I had worked with on several cases before, I talked to her about the current case. She said she would pass it on to the CID. Then I called Sarah. Hey, Sean, are the documents ready? She asked. Yes, I said. Ted has them. Just tell me when and where would be best for you, and I'll get them to you. Or I can give them to your lawyer to review before you sign. I didn't hire a lawyer, Sarah replied. You've always been fair, even with those you investigated. I trust you haven't changed. I assume you're proposing to split everything equally. Donovan is grown up, so no child support, right? Yes, I confirm. We sell the house, split the money equally, pay off debts, and divide what's left. We each keep our cars and pensions. It's the fairest way. But what if something goes wrong without a lawyer? She asked. You'll have to trust me, I said. I've always been better at judging people. Fine, she agreed. I'll sign the papers today so we can both move on. Thank you, I said and hung up. Then I called another contact. Hey Gilmore, is the camper okay? 
Yes, Dave, everything is fine. Actually, I wanted to ask you if you still wanted to sell me some land. Do you want the full 37 acres? 37 acres? I thought it was only three, I said, surprised. There's a bit over four acres of riverbank, plus another 33 acres on the other side of the road, he explained. Wow, that's a lot, I said, feeling unsure. Are you buying it to live on or as an investment? Honestly, I love it here. I'd like to build a house, but 37 acres is a lot to manage, I said. How about we meet tonight, catch some catfish, and discuss it over dinner? He suggested. Sounds good, I'll be there by 6 p.m. I'll get the cornmeal and chicken livers. I managed to close another burglary case, return stolen items, and got arrest warrants for the suspect. I was arranging a forensic evaluation for a minor listed in a case when I got a call from Parker, Kilgore, and Hughes. After finishing my work, I called Ted back. Hey, Sean, I wanted to tell you that Sarah signed the papers and I filed them with the court. We're just waiting for the judge's signature and you'll be divorced. Wow, it's that simple, I asked. Marriages aren't what they used to be. Now they're just a convenience or inconvenience, depending on your perspective. I'll send you the bill, Ted said. Thanks, I'll pay it. Let's go fishing sometime. See you later, he said. I finished the activity logs for my cases, logged off, and made a mental list of groceries I needed. Then I went home and changed into comfortable clothes. I found a machete under the camper and cleared the brush along the riverbank behind the camper. I discovered a path in stone steps leading to a ledge about three feet above the water. After 45 minutes of hard work, the place was much better for fishing or swimming if the water was deep enough. I knew I would shower before bed, but I felt so sweaty that I needed it now. After my shower, I stepped out to find David sitting in a folding chair watching kayakers go by. Relaxing, isn't it? Dave asked without taking his eyes off the water. Every day I like it here more and more, I replied. Glad to hear that, he said, unfolding another chair and placing it by the fire ring. I've spent many summer days here. Best place for swimming on this part of the river. Great spot for catching catfish, too. Motorboats won't work here, but kayaks and canoes are perfect. Downstream you can wade in without getting your shirt wet, but right here it's about 12 to 15 feet deep and the water's pretty clear. I grew up here, left after high school and joined the army. My parents died when the house burned down in 86. Nothing was left but two chimneys and a foundation. I couldn't bring myself to rebuild. A developer wants to buy the site to build houses. My dad wouldn't be happy with that. I can't keep paying taxes on an empty lot. I bought a camper to rent out to cover taxes and make a little extra money. But now we're thinking about moving to Savannah or Blue Ridge. My only family is a cousin in Gadsden, and we're not on good terms. We chuckled at that. I don't know why I'm so stubborn about the land, David continued, but let's cast our fishing rods and I'll tell you what's on my mind. Sure, I said with a nod. We set up two fishing rods with chicken liver for bait and tossed them into the river. Then we grabbed some folding chairs and a bottle of Amber Bach beer from the camper's fridge. Dave sat down and started. Here's my offer. If you buy all 37 acres and promise not to sell it to a builder who'd put up houses so close you'd smell your neighbor's breath in the morning, I'll finance it myself at 3% interest and sell it to you for $40,000 and add another $5,000 and if you want to keep the camper. Give me 10% as a down payment when you can and you can include the entire deposit towards buying the camper. You won't get a deal like this anywhere else and no one else will. That's quite a deal. Normally I'd need time to think, but I'd be foolish to pass this up unless you have hidden back taxes or other fees. All taxes are paid, he said. No liens, claims or court issues. I own it fully and can sell it to you. If everything checks out, we have a deal. We'll need a lawyer to make it official, I said. Dave stood up, walked to his truck, and returned with a manila folder which he handed to me. Inside were multiple copies of a sales contract outlining the terms he'd just described. I'd say you planned this all along, I remarked. I saw it in your eyes the other day. Figured we'd get here sooner or later so I called my lawyer on Monday. I'll need to withdraw some money from the bank tomorrow. Dave nodded, approving silently. Just then I heard an engine and turned to see a white Ford expedition. Stephanie stepped out, smiling, 
holding a 12-pack of Yingling beer. Hey, Scout, how are you, Dave? Hi, Stephanie, Dave replied, smiling. Three out of three. You're still trying to get me in trouble, huh? I joked. Yes, I am, she teased with a grin. We caught ten catfish and cooked them with hash browns on the grill, sitting at a picnic table as the sun set. After dinner, Dave said he needed to go home before his wife worried. We walked him to his truck and shook hands. I'll stop by the bank first thing tomorrow and get the money, I said. Fine, I'll take this contract to the court and start transferring the plot into your name, Dave agreed. Thanks for the trust, I said. After signing, whatever you do with the property is up to you, but I bet you don't want neighbors you can see or hear their arguments. I smiled and nodded. Dave drove away, leaving me and Stephanie. She handed me a bottle of beer. We sat by the fire, enjoying the calm evening. I see you cleared up the area. Now you can see the river better, she said. Yeah, I might buy some wood this weekend and start building stairs to the dock, I replied. So are you buying the plot? Staying here? She asked. Yep, it's official. Sign the contract today, I confirm. Good, she said, smiling. We talked for a bit until she suddenly said, I heard a rumor today. A rumor? I asked, curious. Yeah, are you ready to earn your achievement badge, Scout? She asked, playfully. I've already earned almost everything in Scouts, I said. Maybe, but this one's not in the handbook, she teased. Put out the fire and meet me inside. She walked to the camper. I wanted to join her, but I was nervous. My last relationship had ended months ago, and I hadn't been with anyone since. Still, I trusted Stephanie. I put out the fire and made sure it was safe before heading into the camper. After taking a shower, I found Stephanie lying on the bed, a sheet covering her waist. She looked beautiful, her hair spread out across the pillow. I slid under the covers and turned towards her, pulling her close for a kiss. We were not in a hurry, but we couldn't really relax either. The friendly tension between us slowly turned into a warm feeling. We shared an intimate moment. She cuddled up against my left side, resting her head on my shoulder. I softly stroked her back with my hand. Stephanie swung her leg over mine and gently played with my chest hair. We lay there quietly for a few minutes before she spoke. I have to admit, it felt right. I hope you don't feel too guilty still, she said. I know it's hard to change those feelings overnight. Understand? It lasted for six years for me, which is way too long. She seemed like she needed to share her story. Misery loves company, right? So I just listened. Brant was the classic jock. Arrogant. Selfish. Controlling. At school, he was admired by everyone. Students, teachers, even parents. We graduated hand in hand and went to college together, where things started to fall apart. He didn't get the football scholarship he expected. He didn't even make the team. He was so angry, he refused to wear the school colors again. Stephanie chuckled at the memory. When he moved from the small pond of high school to the big ocean of university, he wasn't a big fish anymore, she said. It ate him up inside. He wanted to delay our wedding until after graduation. I knew he was unhappy at school, so I thought marrying him might help him feel better. So we got married during the winter break before spring classes started. Things were fine for a while. We finished our first year and I suggested summer courses to graduate faster. But Brant said he needed a break. I got a paid summer internship with the sheriff's department, which was great for my criminal justice major. About a month before fall classes, Brant came home and said he got a full-time job at a brewery. I asked him if he could handle classes with his new job. He said it might be best to take a semester off to earn money. I then realized he would never go back to school. It wasn't so bad, though. He made good money at the brewery, especially when he started bartending on tours and on weekends. I stayed a full-time student, working part-time, and got paid internships every summer. We lived better than most students. At least those without rich parents. Looking back, he was probably already seeing other people and drinking every day. I kept stroking her back in hand, letting her continue. After I graduated, he tried to get me to work at the brewery, but I wanted to work in law enforcement. He didn't like that. He thought law enforcement was a man's job. I knew he was controlling 
but I didn't find out until later that he was selling illegal substances through the brewery. He had been doing it since he started working there. He didn't want his police officer wife threatening his business. She turned her head to look at me, and I looked back at her. I know what it's like to ask yourself, how did I not see this? She said. I nodded, and she went back to her comfortable position. Despite the problems, I got a job at the department where I interned and loved it. I did well and got promoted several times in two years. The arguments with Brank got worse. We fought, sometimes even physically. The last fight ended with him hitting me and me defending myself with my baton. He left with tires squealing, and then I heard a siren. I didn't look out the window. I turned off my phone, put it down, took a shower, and went to bed. The next morning, I called my captain and asked for a week off. He gave me as much time as I needed, saying he had an idea of what happened. He told me Brant had been arrested for drunk driving and caught with a lot of illegal substances. My world fell apart. I feared losing my job and everything I worked for, but my captain assured me I had nothing to worry about. So I went home to stay with my mom for a week. We talked about my options and other silly things to take our minds off Brant. I spoke with a lawyer to start the divorce and got a copy of the papers to take with me, I asked one of my colleagues to do me a favor and deliver the divorce papers to Brant in jail. After he managed to get the bail money, Brant seemed to decide it was best not to see me anymore. He didn't come to the apartment when I was there. One day, I came home from work and found all his stuff was gone. He even took the furniture from the living room. He left me without a TV or a computer. I thought it was a small price to pay to get rid of him. She turned on her back and I lay on my left side, folding the pillow to prop my head up, so I could see her face better. I started gently touching her belly as she kept talking. I lasted almost six more months before the whispers and suspicious looks became too much to ignore. People thought I must have known about Brant's illegal activities since I lived with him for so long. They believed I somehow avoided getting in trouble with him. There were even rumors that said I was in on it. During one of my visits to see my mom, I applied to the city police department and got an interview the next day. When I explained my situation, I saw doubt in the lieutenant's eyes, and I started to less sure of myself. I told him to call my captain at the sheriff's office to talk about me. The following week, I got a call asking when I could take the psychological and physical exams, and if I passed, I could start once I notified the sheriff's department. After three weeks, I swapped my brown uniform for a blue one. We lay quietly for a few minutes before she spoke again. I've been divorced for 11 years, and although I love going on dates, I don't date seriously, she said. Well, it's nice to know, but I'm a bit embarrassed too. I can't see myself wanting to seriously date someone for a long time, I replied. I'd be silly not to want to spend time with you when we can, though. As I mentioned the other day, you'll be very popular with some single women I know and soon. But right now, you're mine. She pushed me onto my back, placed her leg over my hips and started kissing me. We were close again. You should start taking vitamins for strength. You might even have to remove the barrier on the road, she teased. Okay, you've been hinting at something. Just tell me, I said. She smiled at me. I told you I don't date, but I like having fun. Many of us here have had bad marriages or serious relationships. We have a group where we don't have to be lonely or risk another bad relationship. How does this work for you? I asked. It's not perfect, but it's good. Sometimes people here decide to be together exclusively, and it works out. We've had a few who couldn't handle their jealousy when they liked someone else. They might have been the problem in their previous relationships. Now, we have a group of almost two dozen people. You've already talked to some of them. Really? Who? I laughed. A couple of men and one woman, she answered with a smile. Well, who is this woman? I asked. You'll know if you decide to join us. It's not really a test. I think you'll fit in and you'll like it. But if it's not for you, I hope you'll still be happy to see me. This has been the best night I've had in years and I won't stay away. I smiled and hugged her before turning off the light. Good night, Boy Scout. Good night, beauty, she said. We must not have moved during the night because when I woke up, we were still in the same position as when we fell asleep. I tried to remember the last time I woke up with a woman cuddling me in my sleep. It had been months. It seemed wrong to wake Stephanie, but we both needed to get ready for work. 
I leaned over and kissed her forehead, turning her content smile into a broad grin. Good morning, Boy Scout. Good morning, beauty, she replied. I could get used to this every morning. You better not spoil me too much, especially after what I said yesterday about being a free spirit, she said, stretching and yawning. It's a shame we don't have time to play this morning, but we both have to work soon, I sighed. Stephanie pouted. At least you brought clean work clothes, so you don't have to rush home first, she noted. I quickly dressed while bacon cooked in the kitchen, filling the trailer with a delicious smell. I know this isn't the best time, but I need to tell you something, she said. My fingers paused on the third button of my shirt. Yesterday I mentioned a rumor about you, but I didn't say who I heard it from. I waited for Stephanie to finish getting ready. Sarah came to the office yesterday afternoon. She wanted to speak with the head detective on the realtor case. When she got to my desk, she said she wanted to confess her role and testify against the other employees in the agency. She gave a written statement explaining how she got involved, how she helped with sales, and how much Sutton paid her. She dated several clients but didn't ask for any leniency. Sarah wanted to admit her mistakes and start her punishment. She said she had hurt the only person she ever loved. Because of her actions, she lost the one thing she valued, her marriage. She admitted to sleeping with five different clients, one of them twice. She said she never slept with Sutton. He only touches his wife. Instead, he uses trusted employees to find new girls for the program. He's afraid of being accused of harassment if he recruits them himself. Jessica was the one who introduced Sarah. Sutton's wife, Carmen, apparently provides pills for erectile dysfunction and distributes illegal substances to make extra money. Other girls aren't trusted with the drugs. I talked to the prosecutor before leaving the office. We're meeting today to discuss our options. I'm telling you this because I need to know what you want to do about Sarah. What do you mean? I have nothing to do with your investigation, I replied. No, but you were pulled into this mess and she lied to you. She betrayed you. Anyone would understand if you wanted to see her suffer without mercy. No, that's not my style. I don't enjoy seeing her in pain. Destroying her won't fix what happened. Do what helps your case the most. Don't worry about me. Look at this place. I'm already healing. Every day here is better than the last. I'm afraid of tomorrow because I fear if I blink, everything will disappear, and I'll wake up in my old life. Well, what we discussed with the court is that in exchange for her testimony and pleading guilty to six charges of sex trafficking, the prosecutor recommends 12 months in prison and a $1,000 and fine for each charge to be served at the same time. Since she has no criminal history, the prosecutor suggests she serve one year of probation and pay half of the fine. What about Sutton? We are still gathering charges against him. He currently faces at least 28 charges for pimping, aiding or abetting sex work, and three for running a brothel. We are also adding charges related to drugs. He could face several years in prison and a big fine. Sarah will have a year of probation and a $3,000 in fine. Sutton's real estate agency won't survive this. I'm sure of it. Sarah will lose her real estate license, her home, her family, and her good name among our friends. Why did she do all this? Was she bored? Did she fall in love with money or the power over these men? If you want to know, ask her. She seemed broken when I spoke to her yesterday. Cashing her almost broke me, I muttered. You'll start to feel better soon. I think I am, I said with a smile. Now tell me who in the group I met this week. Mickey, she said with a smile. Mickey Ramsey, from the Department of Children and Families. Not the one I suspected, I said. Yes, she hoped you would offer her lunch during your meeting yesterday. Wow, I replied. Stephanie finished getting ready to leave with a playful smile. I'll call you this afternoon to update you on the prosecutor's case. After we finished getting dressed and had a quick breakfast, we headed out to face the day. See you later, Boy Scout. Do you think I've outgrown that nickname? I asked. Maybe, but I still like when you call me beautiful. She replied with a smile I was starting to love. Well, I hope your day is at least half as wonderful as you are. Nice line, she said with a sparkle in her eye. She leaned over and kissed my cheek, then turned and I followed her to the door. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, 
Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.